going, Preston Outdoors fans? Welcome back to the Pop, a.k.a. the Preston Outdoors podcast. In this week's episode, we're going to have Kent Middlestead joining us. But first, I want to do a little housekeeping here. Again, welcome back. If you guys haven't already, go ahead and like and subscribe to wherever you're streaming the uh, podcast at. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and like um, the videos. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel. That way you get a notification every time we upload a podcast or we upload new videos. Um, also, head over to the Preston Outdoors website. You can find a in the blog post there. You can find where these episodes will be linked. And also in the blog, leave comments and questions that you may have, some things that you may have questions for some of the guests that we have on here, and questions or comments that you think we should do episodes on um, very open to your, your interaction. And I think it'd make a lot more fun being able to do shows and stuff like that, that you guys want to hear about. So without further ado, Kent, welcome to the, the podcast. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on the pop. <laughs> <laughs> Some funny little term I thought I came up with again, like I said before, I like it. I've told you before and I mentioned it in the first episode, this is only about a year and a half of planning to finally sit down and see how actually you, uh, easy it is to do so some silly little acronym who knows if it'll stick or not but we'll see how it goes but so for the folks at home that don't know obviously I know this and you know this um tell us a little about yourself Kent this is Kent Middlestead I don't know if I guys have mentioned that but I said it before in the beginning well where are you originally from Kent here because uh, I know you're from Minnesota but what town are you are you home based at I would say yeah I grew up in Minnetonka Minnesota so a lot of people that fish a lot or know know much about bass fishing know Lake Minnetonka is a great bass lake and so that's kind of where I grew up and where I cut my teeth fished in tournaments and all that so um, Minnetonka's home. And so this year you are fishing the Bassmaster Opens you're fishing the northern and the southern region and possibly the centrals I know you had said something before about getting into those and then you just finished up Finish uh, fishing your first MLF Toyota series event. Now. Where was that one at? That was down on Lake Gunnersville, which uh, I've been there once before actually twice before for tournaments um, First time I was there is my first time ever fishing as a co-angler out of state and uh, fish fish Lake Gunnersville similar time of year um, it was five years ago, so it was a lot different than it was this time. But um, uh, and then my second time fishing there was uh, Bass Nation Regional, um, and it was a 200 boat tournament, and it was in April. So um, definitely later in the pre-spawn phase, like when I was just down there uh, last week, it was pre-spawn, but it was winter basically. It was kind of the phase that all the all the fish were in and um and it felt like winter too it was like uh 24 degrees when we blasted off and um uh, froze our butts off basically the whole week practicing and all that so it uh wasn't the warm vacation i was looking forward to but um we're down in florida now so we're we're getting uh definitely a good dose of uh warmth down here so yeah, that's you guys got stuck in the. I mean, Texas got all the snow and ice and rain, and then over in Alabama, you guys got stuck with some of that colder, colder non-seasonal temperatures anyway as well. Yeah, so, it was. Go it ahead. was unreal. There, I was going to say, there's a lot of things that you don't think about that freeze up on a boat. Um, <laughs> we had lids, like all the compartment lids were froze. Uh, there was several guys that have hot foots where their hot foots were froze, so they couldn't accelerate and um, guys gear shifters wouldn't move it was like complete chaos the first morning did you have um, problem getting boats off the bunks or anything like that no actually I, I didn't see that as an issue um i've heard that before like definitely in previous classics bassmaster classics where yeah, they have yeah. these cold launches I've, I've heard of that happening um but that was one thing that didn't fortunately fortunately didn't have troubles with that but like everything else, my breakers, my main power switches, um, they froze in position. So like everything in the boat is wet. So like basically everything is froze yeah. solid. But like we got think- through it and it was an experience. And, you know, a lot of people think a guy from Minnesota should be prepared for, um, you know, the cold weather like that. But we don't have tournaments when it's 20 degrees out. Like our lakes are all froze by that time. So, so. Um, yeah, it, it was a new experience for sure. Your boat's in the shed still or in the in storage still when it's 20 degrees out, not have to worry about operating a thing. Exactly, yeah. yeah. 
So yeah, Kent already mentioned it a little bit. He, and I said it too, he's actually in the process. He's was down in, in Florida and Alabama fishing the MLF Toyota series, he did one of those. And then he's gearing up here now in Florida, like he mentioned on what lake are you on fishing, pre-fishing again? We're on the Harris Chain of Lakes, which is like north of Orlando, just uh, 30 miles or so. So the Harris Chain of Lakes, he's getting ready to kick off the Bassmaster Open Series. Um, that's the Southern Division, I'm pretty sure. And yep. um, one of the main reasons I wanted to get on, Kent on here, I told you guys in the very first episode, if you haven't watched it, you need to go ahead and check that out, where I talk about not only are we going to be talking about seasonal things that are going on, hunting, fishing, that kind of thing per year or per the time of year. So, I mean, we did the second episode ever on the pop was literally an ice fishing episode where now the third episode we're going to talk about something that's unconventional that most podcasts that are going on up in our region north dakota minnesota the midwest really aren't talking about and that is someone like kent who taking off from minnesota is now down south and literally how long are you going to be on the road uh it'll be about three months so he's leaving his home for three months what are the main subject that when Kent and I talked on the phone last week, I was like, dude, this would be an awesome podcast to talk about. I was like, what he has to do and get lined up to take off for three months. So when I'm thinking about, man, it's going to be 25 degrees out, maybe I should go shoot an ice fishing video or something like that, or on my list to, to do things, it's go through my tackle and get stuff ordered before I take off for the first central open in March. He's literally already gone. He's got months and months of stuff to prep ahead of time. So I thought, well, what the heck? This would be a perfect non-conventional episode to just see what other people are doing from the colder north or the Midwest, like where we're from, and how he's taken off here. So we're going to dive into that in a little bit here. But, I mean, I know Kent pretty well. And so I'm going to ask him some questions here, some random, just so the folks at home can get, you know, get to know you a little bit. But what, I'm going to ask you some typical questions. I got three of them on here that are, I mean, super easy, cheesy. You give me, I think I'll pretty much know the answers to them already, but obviously you're a bass fisherman by heart. You're doing these bass tournaments, you know, um, close to the pro level. And I would say, what, what is your favorite, um, fish species to target? Oh, my favorite by far is smallmouth bass for sure. Yeah, it doesn't have to I be am... bass. You can pick anything, any species in the world that you want yeah, to, that you want to it. target. It's a smallmouth. Yeah. So I mean, why the why the smallmouth? Why why that mystical brown creature? Oh, I just love them. I love everything about them. I love the way they fight. I love the way they feed. Um, I like their aggression. Um, I like that they're kind of hard to get sometimes. Like um, they're unpredictable sometimes. So it, so it makes it just more challenging. And um, not that I need more challenge <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> but. But I just think they're fun, man. I think they're beautiful looking. Uh, I like the colors and um, yeah, I just, I, I love the way they fight. I think is kind of how it boils down is like, that's the number one thing is just their aggression and their, their fight. See, I'm a, I'm a, we could do a whole new episode on that. For me right now, I'm the other opposite side of the spectrum. Like yeah. I would rather fish for largemouth, and I think most yeah. of it has to do. Some of it has to do with what you're saying is the difficulty of level to catch those things and how much they move, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But also, it comes down to the gear. Like I just yeah. tend to be a big meat head. I want fifty pound, sixty pound braid, big old meat stick in my hand, and then go to catch. You know, catch those those largemouth tend to be in those i mean sometimes less than a foot of water and the nasty thickest stuff i'm like that's where i'm like oh this is cool so the same thing to where in similarity between both of those where the smallmouth like yourself are harder to catch you know with how they move and stuff i like to catch the largemouth that are like way overlooked because the cover and the maybe even the depth that they're at so i know that is definitely a, a, a episode that you and i could do and go back and forth and stuff like that but it, it's cool to see the reasons why people want to target you know one over the other oh for sure yep great your favorite type of fishing if you had to pick one um favorite type of fishing probably uh it's hard not to say top water just because that's such a rush uh mm -hmm. especially with smallmouth when you've got like two or three fighting over your um spook or your shower blows or whatever you're using out there that, that's that's a pretty good time but i'm also like sickly obsessed with uh electronics fishing so like 
dropping on fish or casting at marks that I see on my pan optics. That's what I figured you were going to say is this is kind of the electronics using, um, you know, even the offshore stuff, the amount of time that we've been able to talk together and fish together. It's kind of like, that's what I was expecting to say too. I mean, top water hands down and no arguing with that at all. Yeah. But, but yeah, like you said, you're, you're dialed in and want to be more dialed in with the new technology that comes out there. And that comes with, like you said, I mean, even, even, um, in Alabama, you're telling me about how you finally caught some offshore fish. I mean, that's what you're, what you're looking for and get excited about. Yeah. I don't know why, I don't know why it excites me the way that it does, but to, to be able to idle around and see either fish or a target to cast at, and then, um, spin around and line, line your boat up with that target or those fish and actually be able to put them in the boat, just basically using your electronics through the whole system uh it's just i i just think it's super cool it 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 is awesome like for the fact that i i've only been able to do it a few times because i haven't taken my technology really and gone to different places in my boat across the country like you have but this summer i actually did it but i was walleye fishing because most of the time in minnesota or even north dakota it's somewhat the same unless you get to the western part of the state but we're fishing grass and grass why i never knew the term grass is weeds you know what i mean we always just call them weeds well grass fishing per se in the bass fishing world we don't get to see the fish as much and right. you know maybe in the smallmouth fishing and stuff you do a little bit more but like for, for the lakes that i fish or my home lake is like i don't get to see the fish unless i visually right. see them with my eyes i don't get to see them with my underwater eyes to grab so we were actually fishing um we went to lake sakakawea one time and we went to devil's lake and i was able to side scan you know, rocky points and, and flooded timber and then went over fish with the down scan. I could see the blobs and I, we were just trolling. I went, I think there's fish here. All of a sudden, boom, boom. But as soon as you went over the blob, you're getting bit. And I was like, this is amazing. I skipped, yeah. I skipped a half mile of water. Like we, yeah. I was just idling and my dad and my cousin were with me and my cousin's son. And why are we fishing? Why are we fishing? I don't see any. Like I said, every, the last two days, we were there for three or four days in Devil's Lake. I said, we, if we don't see any fish, we're not catching them. The ones that we saw were aggressive. So we just sit there with our rods up. All of a sudden, you'd see something off in the distance. We'd spin around, drive over top of it, down scan, boom, 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 turn around, drop the poles, drive over them. And I'm sitting in the back with the Altrex uh, um, remote. And I'm watching the screen and we're just driving the bass boat out there trolling for walleyes. But it's, like you said, it's, it's an addicting feeling. When you see those marks, you can spin around and catch them. That's just, oh, it, it, like you said, there's no way to explain it in, unless you've done it before. Yeah, there's something, there's something to that feedback that you get when you actually catch a fish that way too. Because you're always like kind of skeptical, like, is that just a blob or is that interference or is that actually a fish? And then when you turn around and make a cast at it <laughs> and it reacts to your bait, it's just the coolest thing ever. Yeah. And you've got, you've got the setup too, where you've got the, the forward facing sonar on your boat to where you can really get dialed in. And that's the, yeah. what I have with mine is you side scan. We've talked about this before at length. You side scan, I mark waypoints, I turn around and then I have my graph up front and I'm literally just fan casting at waypoints. I mean, I right. saw them five minutes ago, but I can't see the structure or the fish that I marked. Where you can go up there, you can see the structure you've marked, you can see the fish, and then you've ta you I mean you've got the ability to take it that next step further. Makes it more addicting, more productive, and I mean that's more why efficient I, for sure. Yes, for hundred percent. No wasted making, gas. Yeah, well, I mean maybe one or two, but yeah. not fifteen like it used to be. 15 and feel ah, i think the weed line was right here well yeah the buck was off or something like that i mean most of the time what i think about it too is if you've got those waypoints out there and you've got the forward facing sonar you pull up to it and those waypoints are just an estimate of where it's at right. your forward right. facing sonar is exactly where it's precision yeah yep. exactly oh we could talk about that too oh yeah, we got, we got so stuff. much stuff the next question <laughs> i got for you, what is something you enjoy doing outside of fishing I know you're a fish head, fish nut. What's something that you enjoy doing outside of fishing? Oh, um, nothing. Yeah, yeah no, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> no, I like uh, so. Um, I like to play golf a little bit, I guess. But um, really, I just like hanging out with my wife, Melissa, and we like to go to new restaurants and 
uh, foodie and do that kind of thing. She loves to travel, so she comes along on some of these uh, fishing trips. But um, it's also cool to do a little bit of sightseeing and do some of the touristy stuff uh, with her when when we have the chance or when we go somewhere that's worthy of doing that. Like a place like Muskogee is kind of hard to convince <laughs> Melissa to come with me, but <laughs> there's some good stops along the way. So. No, and that yeah. makes it cool that she likes to do that side of thing to where if you, you know, you need a break from being out on the water, you've got something you can line it up and, and be able to go enjoy it. Because, I mean, yeah, for the most part, doing the opens and, and if you get to the elites or any level, you're going to come by that stuff at some other time. I mean, most of these fisheries repeat themselves, but it's nice to take it in and, and enjoy it for like, for me, I, I really care about sites, you know, I'm planet point a to point b where my wife is the same way she wants to go see this she wants to go see that it's like okay we'll go see it and then because um, i'll never know if i'll get there again i mean there's no guarantees so that's that's uh yeah that's one of the questions because i know how much you fish i know how much you love to fish and that's all you want to do for i mean we've talked about it at length i mean i'm in the fall i'm hunting you know we're hunting hunting and fishing mix a little bit more and stuff like that or you get you the ability to travel and do all the all the fishing and stuff so this i, I thought there had to be something besides fishing that a guy's got to enjoy a little bit yeah yeah um a lot of people are surprised that i don't hunt too because there's so many just fishermen that hunt too but yeah I, i've got all my time and resources into fishing for sure so yeah, right I mean, that. there's a lot of guys on the on the pro level too. That's what there is no off season. The off yeah. season that they have is a what month or two where they don't have a boat, and then it's right. work, you know, on the business side of things and stuff. But, but then there's guys, all those guys that were throwing a fit last fall because they had their tournaments, they couldn't go to their deer camp, they couldn't go elk hunting and stuff like that. They had yeah. everything planned out and stuff. So yeah, it's just, you know whatever for how hard the fishing gets in the south i can see why all those guys want to switch to hunting too <laughs> makes sense i didn't think that was a thing i didn't yeah. think fall fishing i thought fall fishing was amazing like it is up here but it's ugh, it's i definitely had my eyes open big time from fishing even 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 in june-ish in oklahoma but definitely october and november um down in alabama and texas i was like golly no wonder these guys beat their heads against the wall <laughs> no wonder they go sit in a deer stand <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh so like I, I mentioned at the beginning of the show we're gonna get to it this time of year we're thinking of ice fishing up here traditionally we're thinking of ice fishing we've done some episodes on ice fishing um you know some of these episodes you'll hear on is how to catch fish during the the awful time ice fishing that mid-season how are you gearing up for late ice, stuff like that? But, and like I said, I'm thinking about, I got a list somewhere in here of what I need to order. I need to go through all my tackle, prepping for when I take off. And even for me taking off in March, that's like early for up here. Most of the time, your tournaments aren't starting till after May because of the season in Minnesota. Or well, end of May, June is when that season really kicks off. Um, but we're not thinking about what, what I want to talk about today. And it's, like I said, it's you taking off. When did you leave? um february like second or something like that beginning of february you're yeah. taking off and you're gone for three months and you're fishing you're fishing these these big time tournaments what's it take for you to get stuff prepped to even just think about taking off oh like time wise it takes it takes weeks <laughs> yeah i mean it feels like it does uh you know it's it's like it's a little bit here a little bit there um we had a little bit of December and all of January to get prepped uh, for our net for basically for this year and definitely for the spring. Um, so it, it's, um, it's a lot of lists. Like I'm, I make a ton of lists. I do a lot of visualization of like what kind of things am I going to come across and then uh, basically write down anything that I think that I'm missing from my list and but then you know you can you can think of everything that you need but you also at the same time have to sort of pack light too you can't bring everything that you own so um you you've got to be efficient at the same time um so yeah i mean it, it's it's just kind of going through in your head like all the different scenarios that you might come across like there's so many different things uh, i mean fishing is one but like boat maintenance is another and then 
taking care of your RV is another and, um, you know, dealing with the vehicles, like a, I just had to have an oil change. Like, you know, you don't, you don't normally think about when you're on a road trip about going to get an oil change. I mean, it's just stuff like that. Like, um, there's so much that goes into it. Uh, and yeah, I think, uh, the biggest aids for me are, um, uh, just keeping notes and having, having a list, having a, uh, a bunch of different lists really and then keeping a good calendar and kind of um, planning out I use Google Calendar and basically every single day I've got filled with things that I need to take care of whether it's a pre-fishing day or or a day where I have to change oil on my outboard or whatever it might be like um, it's always there's always something <laughs> yeah was, uh, you touched on the point that I was gonna say it's, it's not just tackle right like when I when I my small window I'm not comparing it to you three months, but my small window, if I take off for a week to do these opens, like, what am I going to need? Like, I don't know what covers down there. You can do as much research as you can, but you're going to fish with you guys at some way and you're going to get a boat, like just from a tackle aspect, like, okay, I can pack my clothes for a week. That's fine. But my tackles like what? So I just bring everything. I just bring everything, whatever. But it's not just you packing tackle for these fisheries that you're going to fish in a three month period, not a week. And like you said, you've got a camper, you've got a tow vehicle for the boat, you've got a tow vehicle for the camper as well. Maintenance, food, laundry. I mean, obviously you can go buy clothes if you need some. I mean, you mean just, but everything, it's just, it's hard to wrap my mind around it from when we talked before and try and explain to somebody that doesn't understand what goes into taking off for three months not a va- i mean it is a vacation somewhat but you and your wife are both working and you're there on a business trip you have a goal you want to qualify and move move up it's not like you're taking off for close to a third of the year quarter of the year just to have fun you know what i mean it's i mean it's going to be fun don't get me wrong everything like that that's not what i'm saying what i'm saying is like there's a goal to this this is a business trip in a way because you you want to qualify you want to move up you know want to fish the elite series someday and stuff like that so like you said it's just not even those four vehicles but you even mentioned boat maintenance truck maintenance you mentioned back going back to wichita for your camper for camper maintenance it's just we think of like i'm going on a camping trip for a week how much food i my family goes on a camping trip every year for a week the amount of food that we bring is unreal of course is on the preston side thing we we do way too much food always pack way too much and we cook way too big of meals i mean it's just how it how it goes but trying to take that week of what i'm picturing from clothes my tackle my boat stuff like that and then trying to expand it to three months your lists have to be up the wall to make sure you're bringing everything yeah it's nuts it and like i said it's it's harder to it's harder to leave things behind than it is than it is to you know think of things to bring for sure because you want to bring everything i mean you want to have basically your whole life cuz you're spending a quarter quarter of the year at a time on the road and um so you're yeah, trying to pare things down and um bring everything that you need but still like um i mean we absolutely had my truck fold to the top and we had um we had the boat and rv in storage down south because it didn't make sense to bring it home just for the month and a half that we were going to be in the frozen tundra so we yeah. so we left those down south so so that made it a little bit trickier to pack everything as well um but yeah it's 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 lists and it's calendars and um and uh Another thing we haven't touched on yet is the logistics of getting from place to place. And that's where you came in in Muskogee. But um, Melissa and I literally sit down with a basically a map that we draw out of the United States and plan a, you know, trip A to B to C to D and um, just kind of figure out, you know, where things are going to go at what time and then start planning out campgrounds and um trying to get those booked ahead of time and you know it's crazy like so many things have changed since the coronavirus like it used to be you could just kind of willy-nilly get a campsite whenever you wanted to at one of these fishing venues because 
it wasn't as desirable and more people were staying in motels, but now everybody wants to camp and camping industry is huge right now and campgrounds are all full. So you have to plan way ahead of time. And I've got all my campgrounds booked for the year. Um, had that done back in January and, um, um, yeah, if, uh, if I didn't have them booked, like I'd be worried about where I'd be staying. <laughs> and, um, so yeah, and it, there's a lot that goes into it for sure. <laughs> Yeah, you spent you spent two months ahead of time just making sure you have a place to park that thing and sleep, yeah. basically, is what it is. And I can imagine you and your wife packing everything you think you need into your pickup. It's probably a blessing in disguise. Did you bring one or did you bring both down? We just we just had the one truck. Just had the one. So it's probably a blessing in disguise because that way you couldn't fit everything you maybe thought you needed, and you, so you had to prioritize, you know, unless you did forget something. I don't know. But, yeah, it's just – it's, yeah, no, so so far so good. And I think you're right. I think that kind of kept us at a limit and um, ended up working out pretty well. And, and I was just thinking about with the food, like, you know, you, you'd think, oh, yeah, bring like, bring all this frozen, like, for you, like, bring all the wild game and stuff. But then you get here and you've got uh, <laughs> a refrigerator that's like, you know, this big, because <laughs> it's an RV, like everything's smaller, you know, so. Um, yeah. we ended up, we ended up, uh, packing all like a bunch of beef. We get a quarter steer, um, every once in a while and brought a bunch of beef and packed the freezer full with that. And then, um, you know, obviously make grocery runs here and there and try and eat as much in the camper as we can. So we're not eating out all the time and all that. So that, I mean, that's one of the nicest things about having the RV is just being able to do meals and um kind of have that it feels more like home than if you're staying in a hotel and you're like warming things up in the microwave or going out to eat more more than likely all the time so. those hotels are right across from some of the best fast food it's it's always inevitable it, there's a fast food yeah. place oh, i can warm up a cup of noodles in the microwave or wendy's or something like that you know what i mean so yeah exactly. you're the human aspect of it you sneak over there to do that or whatever but, yeah. So you, you said so I want to touch on on the tackle side of things. I know I'd mentioned my very small window of prepping. How do you go into um, prepping enough tackle? I know I mean the boat's got lots of storage, and you can take and pack that thing as much as you need from your home, and then you can take stuff out as you need it, put stuff in, move that revolving around. But the initial the initial say leaving home with all your tackle to put it in the boat because you're gonna be gone for three months i mean i know the pros talk about it you look at their back of their trucks and their cab is just completely full of stuff they got all the fancy schmancy things and they're gone for you know sometimes three four months at a time is there a system that you have or something that you do that works for you that if somebody say i was getting in to do this to fish on the pro side and I needed to pack for three months and take off. Is there a couple tricks that, or tips that you would give a guy that's you know going to have to make this this run to be more efficient to get everything down there that you think you would need? Is something that you've learned doing this? Um, I guess I only have a couple of tips that way. Um, so I'm a little bit different than a lot of a lot of the pros like you're talking about where they they switch out tackle and they have stuff specific to a specific lake like i'm i guess i'm kind of a minimalist that way where everything that i own is in the boat at all times um i have one tote with plastics in it and then maybe a little bit of overflow tackle that goes in a cardboard box and that's it everything else is in the boat so um my boat set up pretty nice to where i've got a uh, center rod storage where I keep all my my rods and reels and then I've got a, a starboard rod locker where I keep like the one the ones that I don't think I'll be using so for me it's more just like keeping them out of my way so that I can get what I think I'm going to need for that tournament um, easily accessible and then just put those that I'm not going to use off to the side um, but yeah they're always there and same with all my tackle, like, um, I only, I only bring as much with me 
as I can fit in the boat beyond it's, those couple. And, and if, um, you know, the, the one, the one tip that I always give guys is, uh, don't try and load up on things that you think you're going to need, uh, if you're going to a new place. So, um, I used to run into that all the time. Like I, I started out fishing the opens as a co-angler and I would want to make sure that I had every top 10 bait that I looked up on the Bassmaster open or, you know, the previous Bassmaster yeah. results slides and get every single one of those top 10 baits and have five of them each or whatever, you know, like I would just waste so much money and then I'd get there and it'd be like completely different. Or, you know, like the phase that the fish are in are a little bit different. So they're not, they're not using, you know, they're not biting on those lures that you thought they were going to or whatever. So I guess my point is like, hold, try and hold off as much as you can on buying that stuff and just um, wait till you get down there and see the waters. Um, I, I like to do tackle orders from Omni and Fishing. They're like online uh, tackle retail store and they, get stuff to you in like two days and they have basically everything that i need so that's what i do a lot of times is i get down to the venue see what i need and then order from them but you can also certainly you know, go to local tackle stores and you know they'll usually have the the hot baits too sometimes it gets tricky with that um where you can't find what you need it just kind of depends on the on the town like when you're in texas like it's no problem uh there's yeah. so many good so many good tackle shops down there like down around sam raber and they've got tackle addict and you know i guess it just depends on where you are but um yeah i mean i guess that's kind of my tip is trying to hold off as much as possible on spending tons of money before you go no that's i mean like you said i i am in the same way like all my tackle that i have which I think it's not a lot compared to a lot of people, but it's in the boat. Like if I'm going fishing, it's in the boat. If I'm fishing a tournament on my boat, it's in the boat. So taking it all, putting in a tote, throwing all my rods in the front seat and heading off to an open really isn't that big of a deal. But I, I we can definitely, like you said before, and when the pros talk about they're, Oh, we're going to X, Y, Z Lake. I need all of this. And they've got tons of totes and they take all their finesse stuff out and they put it away. You know what I mean? So for somebody from the outside looking into that, it's intimidating. Like, Oh my gosh, I need, you know, six feet of boxes around me just to go fish sam rayburn i need to go fish the harris chain of lakes i need my harris chain of lakes kit you know what i mean and it it gets intimidating because it's like dude i have a tackle bag here that can fit six tackle boxes in it and i maybe have 10 more tackle boxes and that seems like a lot to the average guy but as a tournament fisherman that is that's like half a compartment in these boats we have so it's kind of cool to see that you do the same thing that i do because it's like I mean, if you, like you said, if you don't have that much to take along, you can travel lighter and stuff like that. And, and being able to order from Omnia Fishing and being there in a couple of days is, is pretty sweet. I mean, I haven't ordered from them yet. I know I'm going to do, do an order from them because you were telling me about them. But it's basically, if you want to talk about that a little bit more, it's kind of like a tackle warehouse thing. Yeah, it's similar to tackle warehouse. They, they also have some shop by lake features, which are kind of make them unique. So if you are interested in um, um, going to a new body of water, but you don't really know what to use or whatever. There's a bunch of um, a bunch of people that work with Omnia, like myself, who have entered uh, fishing reports for a ton of different lakes across the country. It's more focused in the upper Midwest, so mostly in Minnesota, but um, spreading further out uh, as we get more people involved. But um, so basically, we'll put in a fishing report, say what time of year it is, what species of fish we're targeting, what types of lures are working, and um, just kind of basically the the vitals, and uh, that that will steer the shopper into the right kinds of baits uh, for that particular lake and mm -hmm. that species. So it works out pretty cool, and um, yeah, I mean, and then it's. Uh, it's coming from the Midwest, so it doesn't like unlike Tech Warehouse, it doesn't have to ship from California, California. so it makes shipping times quite a bit faster. And um, yeah, I, I'm uh, 
big fan of it. No, that's, I mean, when you're telling me about it last year, like two days, are you kidding me? I can't even get Amazon prime in two days anymore with, with everything that's going on, you know? So that's what one of the cool features was. Like I said, last year I ordered a box of tube jigs and a raffle of crankbait and it took nine days to get here. Of course it was in the middle of the pandemic and stuff like that from tackle warehouse. But I mean, there's another option for you too. If, if the prices or, I mean, stuff at local because everything around those lakes is going to be up price because people it's going to be easy access but like what we ran to in muskogee i drove over an hour to go to the bass pro shops just to get that stupid red eye shad you know the the lipless bait that we were catching we're catching fish on yeah um you know drove that far where like you said in texas we went you and i went to an academy just five minutes down the road and there was six other academies around us if that one didn't have it. So it's definitely an option, an option for you to do. And I like the fact how you said you, you waited when you got there, you know what I mean? And like, like I said, I, I can definitely see it's a great tip for somebody that's doing this as a co-angler side of things. Like you just mentioned, how many other people are out there looking at the top 10 lists in the mass master magazine or online, or those pictures that you go through when they put the galleries out, they do a good job at that. And you're just hor Okay. This is what they're going to bite on. You spent, like you said, you spent so much money and it's like, you never, you might not catch it. Cause I mean, you know, bass fishing three days later, the bite changes it abnormally to where you can't even, um, they don't even sniff something like that. That was just on the top tens list from the week before. Oh and, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so it's, that's a great tip from maybe you, one, I, one big takeaway I had is like we talked about is you might not have to travel with as much gear as you think you do. You maybe not, because bring your confidence stuff. You can always oh, branch yeah. out, always branch out from that. But in, if you got six boxes of stuff that you never have used or don't have much confidence in, and you're taking it down there because that's the bee's knees, there's a chance that you might, it might be biting on it, but if you're not good with it or not confident in it, how are you going to catch something on it? That kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So here's another thing, just to take it a step further. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but so the way I think about it is, if you go if you go back and look at that top ten bait list, and yep, and you're you're looking through the list, and you're like, oh, I got to have that spinner bait, or uh, oh, I've got to have that um, a brush hog, or something like that. So the way I think about it is like use your own spinnerbait, the one that you've caught a ton of fish on, because <laughs> like you, if if you think like I mean I I really don't think that a fish is gonna say oh no I'm not gonna eat that uh, Strike King spinnerbait because I want a you know a, a War Eagle one or what whatever like you don't have to get that specific so chances are you already have it so that's one thing, and then the other thing is is like if if it's something that you don't already have, say a new technique or whatever, don't try and learn that technique while you're on the road at your, you know, at, at one of these tournaments. Like you're not going to get better at that technique than the rest of the field in the four days that you have to practice or whatever. So um, that was just one thing that I kind of had a aha moment on no, yeah. a, a year ago and just like, stick with the confidence stuff stick with the tackle that you already have and if you need to um kind of um uh resupply or whatever like you know make sure that you've got enough of the stuff that you normally use but um don't go nuts on buying all these new crazy things yeah the same thing you know like you're talking about if you go to such and such lake and they're catching it on a drop shot and you are not good with the drop shot probably not the best time to learn how to use a drop shot come back exactly. home after the event and then practice that and that's i mean that's another great tip there as well for for people that are gonna end up getting into this traveling um to fish tournaments on the pro side or the co-angler side is do your homework at home i mean there's many times you've probably done it as well i've done it when i first try to learn how to uh, well, let's just take the summer recently. Buzz bait, the buzz bait. After after Oklahoma, I had I caught one fish on a buzz bait in my life and didn't even own one. I had to ask Denny to borrow one for the tournament, and he gave me one. He said, "No, I'll just keep it." I brought that back home, and I don't tell you how many evenings or mornings or midday I put the buzz bait rod on the deck, and I said, "That's all I'm using." Got confidence in it. Now I have no problem throwing it. It's the same same thing that way. Don't learn your technique during practice and during a tournament do your yep. homework afterwards that's right yep so from from the we talked about the tackle side and the tips and tricks there is there anything 
from say a vehicle standpoint, since you have two of them vehicle, you can even lump your RV and stuff in there. Is, a, is there something that side of things, the off the water side of, of hauling this stuff around for three months that you've learned or again, tips and tricks for somebody that's maybe getting, maybe not doing it the extent that you're doing where they're pulling, you know, two and two across the country with two tow vehicles, one pulling the boat, one pulling the camper, but something that you've learned now that how many years have you been doing this? Is this your second year full time? Uh, this is my second year with the RV. Second year with the RV. So what'd you my do the third, first time? The first year when you didn't the have the RV. First year I stayed in the hotels. hotels. With two other guys would share one hotel room and it was okay. brutal. <laughs> <laughs> but is there anything you've learned doing this now for your second year? Um, doing the tow vehicles in the, in the RV side of things or the camper side of things that you, you know, could share with somebody. Yeah. So, um, so, so even, even, even when I was in the hotels, um, you know, you still have a trailer with you. So um, definitely I would recommend like trying to get just at a minimum, some confidence in working on your trailer because there's going to be things that go wrong with it. So um you know like changing tires and that kind of thing like definitely before you go make sure that you can get your tire off and put back on um as i say that it sounds easy but <laughs> um there's like little things involved that you might not think of if you're not a mechanic so like for example my lug nuts on my boat trailer um require a thin wall deep socket so I've got a socket set that I bring with me and they're not thin wall. I have some deep sockets in there, but they're not thin wall. Um, and then also if you try and just take like a four way, whatever tire iron or whatever they call them and put that on there, it doesn't fit because it's too thick a wall. So you need a thin wall, deep socket to put on there. And, and fortunately I figured that out before I ever had problems with it, but, um, but like that's one th i mean just an example of something that can go wrong when you're when you're needing to change a tire on the side of the road um so just make sure that you can do that kind of thing uh so i guess what i do is i br i've got like a big tote where I, i've got all my trailer tools in there so i've got everything that i would need to change out a bearing or um you know remove my wheel uh, i use uh I've got a dual axle trailer, so I use something called a trailer aid that you just back your trailer tire up on. You back the good one on, and then you can take the other one off while it's elevated up in the air. So that works out really slick, so you don't need a, a jack at all. Nice. Um, uh, if you have a single axle trailer, they make something similar to that, but um, it actually goes on the trailer, and then you back up to a certain point, and it props it up in the air. So might want to look into that too but um but yeah uh just basically um kind of like every every uh trailer tool that i have just goes in that one tote and uh never leaves the truck it just stays in the back and uh, comes in handy a lot yeah yeah be get familiar get familiar with the mechanic like i said i'm not mechanically inclined at all very mm -hmm. very seldom so if i if i've done something once I can repeat it and do it again, but like to get in and, and, and do a bunch of stuff that you haven't done, probably learning on the road is probably not the best time to be the first time. Like you said, looking at your tire iron, that's not thin wall. It's probably not the best time to be looking at it and trying to take a tire off then on the side of the road and, you know, bum frick nowhere. Right. Yep, exactly. So yeah, build, build some confidence at home before you go in working on that kind of thing. And then, um, yeah, just do a little bit of research and, uh, uh, some safety items so it's good to have like roadside flares and that kind of thing mm -hmm. if you get stuck on the side of the road at night or whatever um, I bring some orange cones with me which came in really handy one time when I got stuck on the, on the side of the road just to kind of keep cars away from you because as much as it's a law for them to move over for a disabled vehicle people just don't do it and it gets kind of sketchy when you're out there on the road so um, yeah and then uh bring a bunch of extra fuses i learned that one last year <laughs> fuses for the truck fuses for the boat 
just uh, an assortment of fuses is definitely a good thing to have with you. And um, just a, an electrical box is a good thing to have with like butt splices and ring terminals and all that kind of stuff. It comes in handy for the for the boat and the truck and the camper and everything. Like just having some electrical electrical gear with you so you can do that stuff on the fly is nice. Because it's not like you're at home. I mean, most people say, yeah, you go to a campground, but it's not most of these places where you're staying. It's, I mean, you're not in, not in the boonies, but you're not like down the block from an O'Reilly's, you know, you're, you're in a remoter part of the area, remote part of the area where you're camping, not only transporting, but where you're camping and staying to fish the lake. But I mean, the nearest place might be 40, 40 miles away to get some of this simple stuff that you need, where you could just simply, if you had it ahead of time switch it do it out whatever and the power of youtube if you've got the if you've got the tools for it um shoot i just put freaking seat covers on my pickup last night which was a pain <laughs> it says so look at instructions there was no instructions in the box so it was pretty simple straightforward but the back seats needed some some more effort and youtube so but i had the tools to do it so it's the same thing you're talking about with electrical kits all the stuff that you do for your trailers blah 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 it's the same thing as fishing tackle if you've got it and you've got a chance to look on youtube you've you you can get by and survive instead of having to go one spend extra money that you're already budgeted for on your your fishing trips and then two the time that you would lose going to do do those things to get it fixed yep for sure Definitely. so one tip that you would give somebody if you're a co-angler like myself that's making the look to make the jump to go try and fish and qualify or you know you're somebody that's going to jump straight from a bfl level kind of thing and you're going to go fish the opens um as a boater what's one tip you think that would you something that you overlooked or something that sticks out to you asking the question for a guy that's going to make look to make the jump in some sort of way um Let's see, one tip for someone just getting in on the boater side. On the boater side. Um, so, I mean, there's definitely no replacement for preparation. I guess my tip would be to prepare as much as you possibly can um, for the event. So spend, spend, spend all the time that you can leading up to the event out in the garage working working on tackle getting tackle prepped um doing map and internet research doing all those things so basically just be really efficient about um or i i guess like really prepared before you get to practice i think that was a mistake that i made was that i was like yeah i don't really have to get my rods ready before practice because i'm just gonna you know go through all of them with a fine tooth comb before the tournament but i'm finding that more and more like that would cause me to like not get out a certain bait because i didn't want to waste time like re you know re-spooling with different line or putting a different bait on so i would just keep going down the bank with whatever i had tied on or whatever you know yeah. so so I think, you know, it's, it's impossible to know what's going on until you get there. So you just have to make the best guess that you can with what you're going to need and um, get all that stuff prepared. Definitely have your confidence stuff prepared. And then, um, yeah, and then on the map and internet research, just spend a ton of time on Google Earth. And like you said, prepare, prepare, prepare. And, it, and for me on the co-angler side of things, I do as much as I can, but this is a different level. I mean, different level from the co-angler side because I do my research and stuff that I feel confident in, but I am not doing near as much as what you have to do because for me, I could go practice with Kent and we could be slamming them on XYZ bait on this cover. But when it comes to tournament time, the guy I get drawn with is doing the complete opposite. So I can't just get locked into this. What I treat our practice for is some baits that I want to get, you know, maybe fish some to see how I feel about it. But being able to be on the water and see what's going on, it's kind of more of a feel thing for me. But if you're making the jump from the co-angler or the smaller regional events, stuff like that, like Kent was saying to the um, level that you're doing, is you need every single ounce to try and 
to where when you get to the water, you've already seen it on the map. You already got some areas that you might want to check out, do that thing, that sort of thing or whatever. But it's not the time to, and the, it's not the time to be looking at the lake per se. Oh, I didn't know this bay was here, blah, blah, blah. That should have been done beforehand. And the tip that I wasn't expecting is what you're saying too, is maybe treat the night before the tournament where you go through your rods and reel with a fine tooth comb. Maybe you should be treating that same way before you leave for practice or before you start practicing. Cause that, that tip that you mentioned there where you catch yourself, Oh, maybe I won't throw this cause this rod's not set up and I don't want to take the five minutes, to put new line on it. I never even thought of that. Like you, you hear map study, you hear all this, you hear this, which is a great tip and it should be used, but the tackle portion of it is something that you didn't even think about. Yeah. So I'm, I'm treating my practice days like minus the fish catching part of it, but yep. as far as like getting prepared for it, I'm treating that, treating it just like the night before a tournament where I'm getting like everything super organized and super like my line is fresh and everything's set up good. Cause like, even even a reel that has like half spool of line on it or something like that like you'd normally think oh it's just practice that's fine but what if making a 25 yard cast or 25 yards less cast is gonna you know i guess that's an exaggeration but 50 foot less cast or whatever you you know what i'm saying like what if that's what if that's not getting far enough away from the boat to where they won't bite it because I've had that happen before. Like I've been on a chatterbait bite where my buddy was just catching them left and right and I wasn't catching them at all. And I was like, what is going on here? And so I sat back and I watched him and he's casting as far as he possibly could. And I was in the front and he was in the back. And so I didn't really know that. And I was just kind of casting normal. Like we were just out having fun. I wasn't like trying to rip a cast as far as I could. And then I started uh, casting like that and start ripping it out there as far as I couldn't start whacking them. So like sometimes, sometimes there's things like that where, you know, like you want to be at your best um, during practice for sure. It takes that one clue. It only takes the one clue. And like you said, I think those are great, great, both great points. And the one that really like, stuck out is the, is the tackle thing. Cause now it makes me think yeah. about, Oh my gosh, I took on Louisville and I had half a spool line in practice i didn't have line for the tournament i mean i just it was just one of those instances where it's like yeah yeah you could be treating your tackle preparation the same way instead of ah i'm too tired i'll rig that rod up tomorrow when i'm on the lake or i've got a minute well that minute you're rigging up you could be checking this you could be checking that i mean it's with this game you mentioned it with that many boats that many people out there you got to be proficient every single day on and off the water to try and get to the next level because it's, it's not, it's not easy. And like you said, if a 20 foot more piece of line is going to make you get clued in on a better bite. So if, if I am Joe Schmo, who's just hopping onto the pop and we don't know who Kent Middlestead is, where can we find you on social media? So that way we can follow along in your adventures trying to make the elite series here. Yeah, so uh, Instagram and Facebook, I'm Kenny Mitt Fishing. That's uh, M I T T, and then um, yeah, that's basically where I'm putting all my stuff out. Okay, and you've been—I mean, you've been pumping out more content. Of course, last year I didn't really know you, so we weren't following each other. But I seem like you've been pumping out more content and more updates and stuff like that this year. Yeah, I've been trying to put some stuff out there. Friends and family seem to enjoy it, so we're trying to put as much as we can out there and now fans that have come to meet you from listening on the Preston Outdoors podcast they're going to follow <laughs> along with Kenny Middlestead the and they're gonna, on the pop baby <laughs> gonna be flooding them followers and them comments but yeah Sweet. follow them there if you guys haven't already again you can follow Preston Outdoors on all these social medias as well but give Kenny a follow like I said he's gonna be he's gonna be fishing a lot especially more in the competitive side that I am and he's doing a lot better job giving you the updates and stuff like that so you can follow along in this day-to-day i want to thank you for joining mr middlestead and i yeah thanks for having me this is fun but yeah thank you for hopping on with us and i do not think this will be the last episode we we have a lot of things to talk about awesome man all right thank you guys for tuning in make sure you check out uh this episode this episode the episodes before and episodes after if you haven't already and thanks for watching